let you just enter into the presence of the Lord tonight. Hallelujah. Help me say his name. Say Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the blessed opportunity to come into your house tonight. To gather, hallelujah, in the meeting place. Hallelujah, where we've set our heart and set our clocks, hallelujah, to say, at this time on Wednesday, we come, hallelujah, here expecting to hear a word from you. Hallelujah, we come here gathered in your house. Hallelujah, to sit at your feet to dine at your table, to feast on your word, hallelujah, and to dwell in your presence, hallelujah, for in your presence is the fullness of joy, hallelujah, we pray, Father God, that tonight, tonight as we come into your house, into your presence, hallelujah, that we leave in change, hallelujah, never the same, hallelujah. Because somebody's going to change somebody. The reason we want to be with you, hallelujah, is because we want to be changed from the inside out. Hallelujah. Change us, Lord. Make us better and better and better. Hallelujah. As we become more and more like you. Let your word be like a mirror. Hallelujah, that as we look into it, we are change from one level of glory to the next because we reflect you in our life. Hallelujah, we thank you for being you. Hallelujah, for being our God and allowing us to be your people tonight. We thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty and holy name, amen. And amen. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a hand clap tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you for coming tonight. Amen. Philippians chapter 2 is what I'm going to ask you to turn to. Amen. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, 10, and 11 is what we're going to read. And on Sunday morning, we started what I believe is a series. Amen. Hallelujah. Understanding Lordship. And on Sunday morning, we discovered, hallelujah, that one of the elements of lordship is discipleship. Amen. Hallelujah. Where we discipline ourselves enough to be discipled. Amen. Hallelujah. Because disciples love to follow Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. There's a difference between a believer and a disciple. Amen. The Bible says in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, when Jesus saw the people that had gathered to hear him speak, he saw the multitudes of people hurting, crying, dying, sighing, trying to make it without God, looking for answers, a sheep without a shepherd. And it didn't say that when he saw them, he went down. It said when he saw them, he went up into a mountain and disciples followed him. Him. Amen. The difference between believers and disciples is that disciples are willing to climb even if it's, that's what's necessary to follow him. Disciples love to follow him. And we can say disciples love to climb because as a disciple, I don't want to stay at the same level. I don't want to stay in the same place. Amen. I don't want to become stagnant, stale, stuck in a rut. Amen. Amen. I hear and I see on the internet people as Christians that feel like they are stuck in stay or stuck in a rut. I've even heard people make the 
make the statement almost that they've outgrown their Christianity, or at least outgrown their church. And that's only possible if you stop trying to climb. Amen. If you stop trying to pursue. If you stop trying to go after the one who's apprehended you. If you stop trying to press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling, high calling, high calling in Christ Jesus. Disciples are willing and love to climb. Amen. And as a disciple, we discovered, as a disciple, I love to be told what to do. Because in God's instructions and directions are guaranteed success and victory. Amen. 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 I love to be told what to do. One of the things I I miss so much about um, Bishop is I had an overseer and a covering that even though I don't do it, if I wanted to, I could just pull out one of his messages and repeat it verbatim, amen, and I'm giving you the word of God straight from heaven. Because I had somebody that could give me some instructions and disciple me. Amen. I love to be told what to do. Because if I'm doing what I'm told to do, hallelujah, as a disciple, the responsibility is no longer on me to wait, make it work. If I'm doing what God tells me to do, the responsibility is not on me to make it work. My job is just to do the will and finish the work as a disciple, and it's God's job to make it work. Amen? Hallelujah. These are principles of discipleship. We have to be disciples because discipleship is part of lordship. And the, I'm going to say this and I'm going to give a message, just a long introduction, but the principle of lordship is if we don't make Jesus Christ Lord of all then we'll find that in areas that we did have a victory and did have a success, we'll start slipping because if he's not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. Amen. Philippians chapter 2. Amen. Chapter 9, I mean 2 verses 9, 10, 11. I'm going to ask that you follow along with me as I read. It says this. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and in things on earth and things under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah. To the glory of God the Father. Amen. Hallelujah. The title of today's message and teaching is Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Understanding Lordship. Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Now in the Hebrew word will be Adonai. In the Greek Lord here is Kyrios. Which means Lord, Master, and Owner. He to whom a personal thing belongs, which has the power of deciding. Kyrios, K Y R, I mean, yeah, R I O S, K Y R I O S, is saying that Jesus has decision making power in my life. Kyrios, the possessor of a thing. That means God owns me. When we say Jesus paid it all, hallelujah, that means he paid for me. He owns me. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And I know that some people don't like the feeling of being owned, but guess what? Hallelujah. Because he owns me, he's responsible for me. Hallelujah. He's supposed to take care of me. He's the Lord, my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not lack. I shall not go without. Hallelujah. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leaves me besides field still waters. He restores me. He Hallelujah. Anoints me. Hallelujah. He blesses me because he owns me. Yeah. Amen. Amen. The owner, one who has control, hallelujah, of my life. 
I'm supposed to let Jesus Christ live his life through me. I'm supposed to let him have control of my life. That's lordship. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Let's go somewhere. Let's go to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21, verses 1, 2, and 3. Familiar verse of scripture. We usually read this around the time of Passover, the Resurrection Sunday, or even a week before. But I want to read it tonight because this gives us a good picture of lordship. I want to understand what it means for Jesus Christ to be my Lord. Because I want him to be Lord of every area of my life. Amen. Hallelujah. And lordship is relationship, fellowship, discipleship, stewardship, and even partnership. And if I'm not letting him be Lord of my life in all those areas, hallelujah, something's going to slip. Mm -hmm. That's right. I got to let him be Lord of my life in every area of my life. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21, verses 1, 2, and 3. Do you ever go back to the way we used to do it where we took turns reading? I'll, I'll go ahead and keep reading. Amen. It says this. Or, or tell us what to do. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, let's go ahead and a few read verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, and we'll let people take turns reading. Okay, so, and when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Beth Bethphage and into the Mount of Olives, they sent Jesus to disciples. Oh, Beth Bodge. Okay, thank you. Say unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. This is a good text that tells us something about the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, One, Jesus came to a town next to a town. And he knew from one town what was happening in the other town. Amen. That helps me to know that Jesus knows what's going on with me. Amen. Hallelujah. And it says that when he came to the town, he said, in the town next to you, you're going to find a donkey and a colt tied. He knows what's going on with me. Yeah. Hallelujah. And he said, when you get there, I want you to go out and retrieve the donkey and the colt and bring them to me. And he said, if the owner of the donkey and the colt ask you what you're doing with the donkey and the colt, tell him the Lord has need of them. Yeah. In other words, when the owner of the donkey and the cult come to you, tell them that the owner of the owner of the donkey and the cult has need of them. And therefore, the owner is going to say, hallelujah, whatever is mine is his because he's my owner. Amen. Amen. That's what lordship means. It means I am his. Hallelujah. It tells me who he is and I am his. And everything I have belongs to him. And everything I am, hallelujah, he's going to take care of it. He's going to make it work. Because he's my lord. Yeah. Hallelujah. And that only works if I make him lord of my Life, Amen. In every area of my life. In 2 Kings chapter 2. We're going to continue to read. Amen. This is a long reading. But this is a Bible study. This is, this is what it's for. We're going to go from verses 1 through 7. And Jaden, if you'll start verse 1. Sis verse 2. Uh, Deacon is verse 3. Deacon verse 4. Six verse 5. I guess I'll read verses 6 and 7. But we're going to read from 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, because I want us to see something about the principle of lordship. Hallelujah. You can't, if you're not following Jesus as a disciple, he's not your Lord. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. Amen. Jaden, if you will, 2 Kings chapter 2. Verse 1. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah that heaven by, into heaven by a whirlwind 
Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Gilgal, okay. Sis, if you will, please. And Elijah unto Elijah, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elijah said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. So he went from Gilgal to Bethel. If you will, please. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elijah and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord would take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. This old Hebrew language, but shut up. <laughs> and Elijah said unto, to him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent thee to Jericho. From Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will leave. I will not. I will not leave thee, so they came to Jericho. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Verse 5. Now the sons of the prophet who were at Jericho came to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord would take away your master from over you today? So he answered, Yes, I know. <laughs> Keep silent. Amen. <laughs> Verse 6 says, And Elijah said unto him, Terry, I pray thee here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan, from Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off and they too stood by Jordan. We see here that as Elijah was following following, following Elisha was following Elijah they went from Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho to Jordan and at each place there were certain sons of the prophets that would go to this point but go no further. They went from Gilgal, which is relationship, to Bethel, which is fellowship, to Jericho, which is stewardship. Hallelujah. You know, when they took the spoils of Jericho, they were supposed to put everything back in the house of God. And then to Jordan, hallelujah, we see that they went from one place to another, and at each point, they lost folks. <laughs> in our lordship walk with Jesus Christ, oftentimes there are levels at which people are willing to say, I'm willing to do this, but I'm not willing to do that. Yeah. I believe he's, I believe in the Old Testament, but I don't believe in the New. I believe that there's a Messiah coming, but I don't believe it was Jesus. I believe Jesus died for our sins, but I don't believe he rose again. I believe that Jesus died for our sins and rose again, but I, I don't believe in the manifestations of the Holy Ghost. And you see, often the denominations come up when people say, I'm willing to go to this point, but not to this point. And even in our personal walk with Jesus, we will say, I'm willing to do this, but I'm not willing to do that and when we put caps on what we are willing to do as we follow Jesus it puts a damper on our understanding of his lordship and we find that gradually eventually progressively continually and ultimately even in the areas where we were 
successful and we did crown him as Lord, we start to slip and find that, that we don't have victory in those areas anymore. If we don't make him Lord of all. Amen. If he's not Lord of all, eventually we'll find he's not Lord at all. A good example of this is Samson. Y'all know the story of Samson. You know, you hear it in children's church or Bible school when you're kids, you say you hear that Samson's strength was in his hair. But the truth of the matter is, Samson's strength was in his fellowship, lordship, relationship with God, and the cutting of the hair was just the last straw. Mm. You know the story. Let me, let me go ahead. It says that um, Samson had three Nazarite vows. Even before he was born, an angel came to his mother and said, Your baby, you're about to have a baby. Your baby's going to be a Nazarite from the womb. So don't drink any strong drink. Don't touch any unclean thing. And when he's born, he's to live by the same thing and don't cut his hair. Don't drink any strong drink. Don't look for the world to be your source of joy. Don't touch any unclean or dead thing. Don't try to turn to dead religion to try to reach your God, but continue to have a relationship with the living God. And don't cut his hair. Don't remove, hallelujah, the covering, hallelujah, of lordship from over his life. All these things were representative of things that were talking about his relationship with lordship. And Samson had a problem with lordship in the area of his women. <laughs> that seems to be a common thing. Adam and Eve feeding from every fruit. So first man, woman was his downfall. Why is this man, 300 wives, 600 concubines, when he was down for <laughs> And the strongest man, Samson, couldn't submit to the Lord in the area of his women. And he saw a woman of the Philistines. And he told his parents, get her. She, she's fine. She pleases me. And his daddy said, can't you ever find you a good church girl? <laughs> Good among the the sons and brethren here in the can't you find a girl that believes like you? He said, I, I, God can't tell me what to do in the area of my women. And so to make a long story short, because of his pursuit of ungodly women, he found himself down in Timnath in the vineyard, the vineyard, where they grow grapes to make the wine, the strong drink that he's not even supposed to be near. As he was down there, he ran into a lion, and then he, the Bible says, rip the lion in half. If you read the story of Samson, the only time he did stuff that he was supposed to do to deliver Israel when it has something to do with his women. He didn't just do it because that's what God told him to do. And so he ripped the lion in half, and he came back, and there was a beehive that had been set up in the be in the carcass of the lion and he touched the unclean thing and ate the honey. It's nasty. It but ate the honey. <laughs> and he gave it to his parents. As two Nazarite vows broken right there by chasing women. 
And so the last one remaining was the don't cut the hair. And it says in Judges chapter 14, after he had went down to Timnath and went in with the prostitute, he came out from the prostitute and fell in love with a woman named Delilah. Not given Jesus Christ, not given God lordship and headship over the area of his relationships. And so it was affecting his, it affected his joy because he went to where they, he wasn't supposed to do when he made the line. It affected his um, relationship or religion because he then touched something that was dead like he wasn't supposed to. Now he's at the last straw where it's affecting his headship to cover his head because Delilah was seeking the source of his strength. I don't want to talk about Samson too much, but Samson wasn't the brightest dude. How many times did Delilah try to trick him into showing her how to defeat him and he never figured it out? Like I said, if you don't give Jesus Christ lordship of everything, you'll find that in areas where you did have a measure of success and victory, it starts to slip. Because how can you believe part of a word? How do you pick which parts you're going to believe? And if you pick which parts of the word that you believe, how do you pick those parts out without disqualifying the other parts? The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And the whole book is good for reproof, for correction, for instruction, for direction. And if I don't take the whole book, hallelujah, how can I believe any of the book? The Bible says this when, when they ate of the Passover lamb going from Egypt into the wilderness, Moses said, God said, eat all of it. Don't water it down. Don't eat all of it. The bitter with the sweet. You got to believe all of it. Yeah. And you got to make it Lord of every area of your life. Otherwise, it doesn't work. <laughs> I'm off my subject a little bit. Have you, you remember back when you did group projects in school? You did group projects in school, and you always had that one person in the group that didn't do nothing. <laughs> and it pulled your grade down as a result. Jesus said, I'm not doing, I'm not doing half of this so you can pull my grade down and pull my reputation down. If you don't make him Lord of all, he said, then I'm not Lord at all. Because I'm not going to take the credit for what you have did and then you blame me because it didn't work. Samson had broken two of his Nazarite vows and he told Delilah about his third. And this is what it says in verse where are we at? Verse let's say 14 I almost know where we now. I think verse 6, chapter 16 excuse me. Chapter 16 Verse 20, and she said, after she cut his hair, Samson, the Philistines be upon thee. 
And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. <laughs> he thought the power was in the shaking. <laughs> and he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. If we don't make him Lord at all, we'll find that gradually, eventually, continually, progressively, ultimately, he's not Lord at all. Because my walk with God is supposed to be progressively changing me to be more and more like him. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. James chapter 1 verse 21. It says, Lay Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. In other words, quit doing that stuff that's over the top. Too much, too much sin, too much partying, too much of the stuff that you know you ain't supposed to do. And receive with meekness the engrafted word. It's already in you. You know what to do. Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. James chapter 1 verse 21 and this is verse 22. And be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Some people, because they haven't let the word of God change their soul progressively, gradually, continually, they're deceiving their own, their own selves into believing that they are under his lordship. Even though they haven't given him lordship over everything, they still think God's hand is going to be on everything that they do. You got to let the word of God change you. I believe this wholeheartedly. That salvation is an instantaneous change where you're translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dark, uh, marvelous light. As soon as you receive and believe Jesus as your Savior, heaven is your home. Hallelujah. You're a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. But that's not the end of what God wants to do with you. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. It should be yes, a progressive, yes. continual, yes. gradual changing and saving of my soul yes. from the inside out. Yes. Where well, I'm letting him become Lord of my life in every area of my life. I don't know about you. Amen. I know the old song says that I looked at my hands and they looked new. I looked at my feet and they did too. But when I got saved, I had the same crusty hands and rusty feet that I had even before I was saved. So there are some things that still need to be changed in me even after I saved. Amen. As I believe you want to. Hallelujah is what changes. Amen. Hallelujah. You want to have a relationship with Jesus and you want to get closer to him. Amen. Hallelujah. But you're, you still laugh at the same jokes initially. You still sing the same songs initially. Amen. Hallelujah. The same stuff that you used to do is still in you. Hallelujah. And like Paul 
oil or water into a glass of motor oil to push the impurities out. Hallelujah. The word of God has got to get in me. The engrafted, ingrained, embedded, hallelujah, implanted word of God has got to get in me to push some things out. Hallelujah. So those areas of my life in which Jesus Christ was not Lord, hallelujah, I make him Lord. Hallelujah. It's a it's a gradual, progressive change in my life, giving him lordship over my life. Amen. Christianity or the Christian walk, hallelujah, lordship is not a destination, it's a journey. And God is constantly changing me when I make him my Lord. I have to continually follow him. Daily following him because I never fully attain being like him. I can't exhaust him. Hallelujah. So I have to always follow him. And he's always on the move trying to take me somewhere. So I can't just follow him here and not follow him there. Because if I stay here and then he's on the moon, hallelujah, it's like I think I'm standing still but because he's moving and I'm standing still, hallelujah, really what I'm doing is backsliding. If I don't make him Lord of all. Understanding Lordship, if he's not Lord of all, then gradually Ultimately, eventually, I'll find that he's not my Lord at all. Because I left the very standard that I set when I said he's not going to be Lord here, then affect how I see him even in other areas of my life. Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord. Yes, Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 3, verse quick. I'm going to my verse 8 real quick. I'm going to shut it down there. I've been talking for a while. Thank you all for listening. I appreciate your attention. Amen. I appreciate you coming in to hear what a little old preacher like me has to say about the Lord of all whose name is above every name. Every. Hallelujah. Who the Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he's Lord. Will and I were talking about this one day and you know at one point in time maybe I thought that it was by a forced thing but we were talking about how it's probably because we may see him as he really is. Jesus. Hallelujah. It'll be a natural, un, his irresistible response to just say, Jesus Christ is The Yankees and the agnostic and everybody that limited who Jesus was, when they see him for who he is, the very awe of his presence and the weight of his glory, hallelujah, that calls them to fall to their knees and say, hallelujah, Jesus Christ is Lord. But I don't want to wait until I see him face to face. To figure out that Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 8. It says, Harden not your hearts. As in the day of provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness. What can happen when God convicts me like Samson in the area of his women? 
or maybe it's in the area of your music that you listen to or maybe in the area of what you watch on TV whatever area that God shows you that he's not Lord in you have a choice of either crowning him as Lord and submitting to the conviction of the Holy Ghost in that area or you can harden your heart and say God can't tell me what to do Jesus. This probably doesn't apply to you, amen. This is just me. This is an area I struggle with, amen. Back when, you know, back in the 1980s. <laughs> that sounds so old. 1985. <laughs> when hip hop was new. Before or right after the boogie went from the boogie to the boogie to be. Never mind, I go behind you. But I was I used to rap. Then I used to you know, I used to, I was a rapper, I you know I had a large music collection and this is one of the areas that I struggled with. Amen. I'm not telling you to do this, but this is what God told me. God told me to give rid of all of my music. Uh-huh. And I was even going to give it away. And God convicted me and said, why are you, why are you going to give your struggles to somebody else? Uh-huh. And so I put all my LPs. That's like a big CD. <laughs> In trash. <laughs> Now, I could have, at that moment, said, this is hundreds of dollars worth of music. This is my music. God can't tell me what to do with my music. I could have hardened my heart. But hardening your heart in one area eventually bleeds over into the next area. If he's not Lord of all, uh. you make it so he's not Lord at all uh. in your life. Amen. And it affects how you receive from Jesus and how you believe Jesus. The Bible says that when Jesus fed the multitudes with two fish, five loaves, they gathered up twelve baskets, they took the twelve baskets onto the ship, and Jesus sent them out on the water, and the storms came, and they fretted and doubted and feared, and the Bible says Jesus came and he calmed the storm, and it says that they did not remember what he did with the loaves. And even says they hardened their hearts. They didn't want to see what God was doing because they were offended. Uh. Don't let when the Holy Spirit convicts you offend you to the point that you gradually Progressively, continually, eventually, ultimately, let Jesus stop being Lord over areas of your life. I'm going to say this and I'm going to close. When, when Mary washed Jesus' feet with her hair and poured the ointment on, Judas said, we could have used that. We could have sold that and gave the money to the poor. He didn't care about the poor. He was <laughs> he was um, administrative fees as the treasurer, I guess it was what it was. He was taking his cut from the money. But the Bible says Jesus rebuked him and said to up. Uh, Unto my death, for my death is why she's doing this. This is preparation for what's about to happen. And 
he was offended to the point that he then went to the people that would eventually crucify Jesus. Because he couldn't get over the offense. Because he hardened his heart in the area of money. And eventually, you know what he got? He got his money. He got the thing that he put over Jesus. He got what it was that he thought he wanted only to find out that it wasn't what he wanted. And it wouldn't do for him what the Lordship of Jesus Christ will do. Because money can't buy you peace. Money can't buy you joy. Money can't buy favor. Money can't buy glory. Money can't buy hell. Money can't do what the Lordship of Jesus Christ over your life will do. Don't put anything over the Lordship of Jesus Christ in any area because he's the king of kings and he does not play second string to anyone or anything and if you put it above him you just cursed it in any area of your life that you don't cry as Lord, you just cursed it. And it's a curse that bleeds over into other areas of your life so that if he's not Lord of all, then gradually, eventually, progressively, continually, and ultimately, you find and you shake yourself like you used to. Uh-huh. You go to do the things that you used to do, only to discover the glory of the Lord has departed. Oh. And He's not really your Lord at all. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you. We thank you and praise you, hallelujah, for helping us to understand lordship. You can't be, we can't say no, Lord. We can say no to you, but if we say no, then you're not Lord in that area. We can't say no, Lord. In everything that you tell us to do, the answer is yes Lord hallelujah I make you Lord master ruler overseer owner decision maker of my life and because you're my owner my overseer my master my shepherd I shall not want I shall not lack. I shall not go without. You'll make me lie down in green pastures. You'll lead me beside still waters. You'll restore my soul. Hallelujah. You'll cause goodness and mercy to follow me all the days of my life. Hallelujah. If I crown you as Lord. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. I believe this book is an outflow and overflow of years of working toward what I believe God said and not always seeing the results that I expected. Mm -hmm. those things that were frustrations to me I know that other people go through those same frustrations I think you'd be doing yourself a disservice if you just read it one time and shelf it you know what I mean Mm -hmm. it's a book that you look at you read um, and you almost got to stop and take notes and just think sometimes 
Well, you heard it here. There's nothing more that needs to be said. Check out Continue at RoyalThoughts.org. We have the ebook up right now. Uh, you can download that. You can pre-order the paperback copy. Um, send it to a friend. Share this video. Uh, nothing more needs to be said. I appreciate you. Amen. I appreciate you. All right. Take care. Continue, 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 continue,